good evening everyone uh, a warm welcome to all of you from uh, university of hyderabad school of medical sciences as uh, nation observes october month is a world breast cancer day uh, awareness month so as every ribbon counts as awareness is power school of uh, medical sciences as initiative uh, today they are conducting uh, the crusade to cancel to cancer so first of all i request uh, dean school of medical sciences professor geeta k vemuganti to come on to the dais and also i request uh, today's eminent speaker dr p satya dattatreya direct dnb director and chief medical oncology services renova somia cancer institute and uh, with a special uh, and opportunity i would like to request my university of hyderabad honorable vice chancellor professor vijay rao garu onto the dais please now i'd like to hand over the session to geeta vemukanti ma'am to continue thank you krishna uh, good afternoon everyone as uh, krishna sri introduced this is a month for awareness of breast cancer cancer is one term which probably not a very good cause but it, in it uh, uh, it unites all of us because uh, the pain and the journey of uh, the cancer affects not one individual but the entire family so uh, we are all aware that how the whole life goes turns ups and down when some of us are affected by cancer and uh, so i would like to thank our vice chancellor for encouraging us to hold such awareness programs and for encouraging us and uh, most like uh, most importantly i would like to uh, thank dr satya dattatreya we all fond fondly call him satya <laughs> and uh, a brilliant person and the first comment our vice chancellor made was oh he's so young <laughs> so young but with such rich experience in cancer uh the whole world i'm sure uh, dr dattatreya will give all the statistics about cancer why should we should be aware of as an oncopathologist myself we have signed out reports of 17 year olds in not only in head and neck cancers but also eye eye cancers eye cancers affect the children as you know and one of our areas of interest is retinoblastoma an intraocular tumor which affects children less than 5 years old and the first comment everyone says is why why my child is affected and how can such a small kid have cancers and there are pediatric cancer the whole division of pediatric cancers is there but one of the important things is probably they are better curable than others so we have um, invited dr satya so to, i wanted to make it very short so that we can listen to him and uh, i would like to uh, request our vice chancellor to give his welcome address and then i will introduce the speaker followed by his talk thank you very much for joining us here thank you geeta garu a warm welcome to all of you and a special welcome to dr satya dattatreya garu a young brilliant cancer medical oncologist from renova somia cancer center as uh, professor geeta vemuganti has just mentioned cancer is a debilitating disease affecting the entire humanity different types of cancers hitting different parts of the world awareness is one of the strongest weapons that we could use against cancer because when we are aware of it it's very likely that we would detect it early if we are not aware of it then we would probably not detect it or detect it too late too late to handle so the best weapon we have against cancer is to detect early any type of cancer so therefore the awareness this this whole week this whole month in some sense is a awareness uh, period globally it is in that on that occasion that we are celebrating dr dattatreya's lecture the crusade to cancel cancer 
it's a very heavy topic cancelling cancer is a very heavy undertaking i hope we achieve it controlling cancer maybe we are achieving it but cancelling cancer is a very tall ta order but we are headed in the direction we don't know when we will completely cancel it maybe some cancers are cancelable and many are not because cancer in a disease context is very very debilitating but in biology context it is very thriving system thrives on it the whole design is such that there is a rapid spread of cancer which is what our system is attuned to once it starts there is no stopping it so it's a very uh, very paradoxical situation it's a disease but it is also we are all programmed to rapidly develop cancer because cancer essentially uses the same mechanism that a normal healthy person uses so it's a it's a very interesting twist in the tail as they say it so um all these lectures would be very useful i hope he will come down to the level of our understanding of this cancer uh, because i am sure you will have very deep clinical knowledge but please bring us to our level so that we can appreciate this crusade very well so this is uh, a talk today but there is one more talk day after tomorrow in the same series so again warm welcome to all of you a very warm welcome to him i think it is his first visit to the campus yes. okay this will not be your last visit we'll keep coming thank you very much Uh, thank you uh, very much, Professor Rao. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, it's the the clinical part of oncology is very different, and the biology is very different. It starts just with one cell to make a tumor. Whether we should stop this cell, whether we should st stop this progress, or whether we should treat it, is de it depends on when you catch it. And the more you learn about cell biology, especially the cancer biology, it is not surprising why we have cancers. It is surprising why we don't have cancers, despite having mutations every day in so many parts of our, in so many cells in our body. And it's the repair mechanism that makes, that keeps us healthy. So with that um, introduction, I would now like to introduce uh, Dr. Satya Dattatreya. You know, unlike the CVs of scientists, we talk about publications, we hear it's all about the work done and which institute he got trained in. That one word speaks all. Uh, Dr. Dattatreya did his uh, both DM, MD, DM, as well as DNB uh, in, from Gujarat um, Cancer and Research Institute. I don't know how many of you know the background of this institute. It started with a cultural event of women with uh, and uh, in that event they had saved 5000 rupees and they thought let's do a good thing in way back in 1960s 60 or 61 and these ladies went to the governor and they said we have this noble idea of starting something and that that's a starting point or the idea after which they got donations they got uh, they got uh, money from the governor and lot of Mr. Shah and they got the land and subsequently and this institute which is now 63 year old uh, is the Regional Cancer Institute and it is one of the centers, one of the best partnerships of state and cancer institutes in the country. And it is one of the best and the number of cases that we see, no one can beat us in numbers from India. And uh, it's not a matter of pride, but it's a matter of somebody's experience that uh, 
he has been trained in such a wonderful institute. And um, he was earlier with uh, Indo-American Cancer Hospital, and then he was uh, with uh, Omega Cancer Hospital, and now he's directing this institute. And uh, with that brief introduction, Satya, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Pardon me, I'm sorry, because it was not in the agenda, it just slipped my mind. I would now like to invite Mr. Uh, Kishore. He is an employee of Railway Hospital and also uh, the chief officer of a foundation called Mother Teresa, which supplies free food for all the cancer patients. I would like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Kishore. He wanted to honor uh, our vice chancellor. <laughs> And uh, sir, Dr. Dattatreya, please, you also join. Yes, so he, for last 12 years, they have, because of some personal tragedy, which motivated him to take up this cause, just like how the RCC started in Gujarat, he took up this Nobel cause of feeding and uh, travel and so many other things which I cannot enumerate now. And uh, there is a lot about him to say, but in the interest of time, I would See. just suffice it to say that he is a philanthropist who takes care of the entire family of cancer patients. Thank you so much one and all, especially VC sir and Dean Madam. The pride, the pleasure, the privilege and the prestige to be a part of this August gathering. This fine evening is entirely mine. And I will talk about the crusade to cancel cancer. As sir rightly mentioned, that seems to be a, a really big and heavy sentence with uh, so many heavy words. I want to bring across the essence of oncology practice to all of you and in the journey make you realize some fundamentals, few elementals and the essentials of how the crusade to fight this disease started. Not many years but many decades or even centuries back and therefore I will take you through the base, the basis, the basics behind the biology of this bad nay brutal disease. The base, the basis, the basics behind the biology of this bad bar brutal disease. So let me first let you know what I am not going to talk to all of you today. So no emphasis, no focus on data analysis, meta-analysis, literature reviews, no high funda stuff. In short, no scientific jargon this evening. So please sit back, relax and enjoy the ride. Everyone you meet has something valuable to teach you. Everyone is my teacher. Bahubali 1 was a good movie. The COVID-19 pandemic, the first wave was bad. Bahubali 2 was better than the Bahubali 1 part, part 1, but the COVID-19 pandemic wave 2 was actually worse than the wave 1. Fortunately, the wave 3 was not at all bothersome and the wave 4 possibly has just passed off and therefore we can say that the COVID-19 pandemic wave 2 is the conclusion of that menace. So in life there is a person for every purpose, for every person or for every virus you meet. The COVID-19 virus taught us many important life lessons to each one of us. So some are there to test you, some will use you, some will teach you and some will bring out the best in you. 
सो थैंक यू सो मच सर एंड मैडम फॉर दिस बेस्ट और दिस ग्रेटेस्ट चांस टू स्पेंड टाइम विथ ऑल ऑफ यू आई डिवाइड माई टॉक इन टू फ्यू सेक्शन एंड अक्टूबर इज द मंथ ऑफ नवरात्रि एंड से एंड देर फॉर हैप्पी नवरात्रि टू ऑल ऑफ यू सी एम ईज मेडिकल एजुकेशन प्रोग्राम्स कॉन्फ्रेंसेस सेमिनार्स लाइक दिस मीटिंग्स एट सम पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम ऑल ऑफ फर्स हैव डिलीवर्ड लेक्चर्स एंड दैट्स वॉट वी ऑल लर्न इन सजेस्टिव यूनिवर्सिटीज एंड सम ऑफ यू स्टूडेंट्स विल डिलीवर लेक्चर टॉक्स डिमॉन्स्ट्रेशंस और ओरेशंस एंड अ गुड लेक्चर शुड हैव फोर वीज सो लेट मी स्टार्ट विथ द फर्स्ट वी ऑफ ए गुड लेक्चर विच इज विद्या विद्या मीनिंग एडिक्वेट ऑन थोरो नॉलेज अबाउट द टॉपिक और सब्जेक्ट ऑन विच यू नीड टू टॉक और एलेबोरेट और डिलीबरेट सो यू नीड टू हैव थोरो नॉलेज अबाउट द टॉपिक ऑन विच यू वॉन्ट टू टॉक टू द ऑडियंस दैट्स द फर्स्ट वी ऑफ एनी गुड लेक्चर बट देन इफ यू हैव टू और इफ यू वॉन्ट टू टीच देन यू फर्स्ट नीड टू लर्न एंड देर फोर an essential reflection of teaching happens in the way how you have learned or mastered the topic or subject so that's the first way of any topic of any lecture which is vidya the second v is vaku you might have excellent knowledge but are you able to make sure the audience gets the right take home messages so to articulate eloquently to communicate appropriately so that the audience gets the right take home messages few of you have done all the homework and hard work but unfortunately when come to expression sometimes we fail so it's important also to use the right gestures sometimes give some pauses sometimes some exclamations so that the audience can understand what you are trying to teach to them before i disclose the third v let me show you some post posters of one movie of shahrukh khan by name rais where he tells us ammi jaan kehti thi koi dhanda chhota nahi hota no job is small aur dhande se bada koi dharm nahi hota there is no religion bigger than your job but for some their profession or job becomes an obsession or greed or lust or show of strength a demonstration of power to give you some examples from history adolf hitler saddam hussein osama bin laden this man america's ex leader and him too the leader of north korea not long back both these last two leaders engaged in a war of words which could very well have turned into a war of nuclear weapons fortunately it did not happen even if you do a facial transplant nothing changes their words and actions are replete with anger hatred jealousy discontent disharmony and destruction so the so called accomplishments and achievements of these powerful people completely fade they turn pale and become insignificant when you look at this lady she stands tall against all these giants mother teresa to your right therefore is strength but to your left is faith so if you you need strength while doing the possible but you need faith while doing the impossible so the powerful people have strength but they can achieve only possible things if you want to achieve the impossible you need to have faith and trust mother teresa tells us god has not called me to be successful he called me to be faithful as a doctor i should not aim to be a successful doctor if i am faithful to my patients success will follow automatically i think that applies to every profession be faith be faithful to your job and success will follow automatically for some early for some late but the end result will be success so in oncology practice as sir rightly mentioned treating cancer 
many of sometimes we can cure this dread and actually the word cure can be used for some of the cancers but many a times we end up controlling the disease and making sure the quality of life is maintained or improved so when it comes to cure you need to cure with passion otherwise when it comes to care then care with compassion i think that's the mantra of oncology practice because unlike cardiology neurology nephrology we still have not achieved the 90% or more than 90% success rate at least in cancer clinical cancer practice your profession is not what brings home your weekly paycheck your profession is what you are put here on earth to do with such passion that it becomes spiritual in calling so mother teresa is a embodiment of modesty and humility and that's the third v which a person delivering lecture should have vinayam vinayam is modesty and humility to be able to communicate knowledge effectively should never make us ar- arrogant in fact it's a lot more better to be ignorant and also be honest about that because there will be always someone better than you out there and if your arrogance are up seem on the wrong side then you had it in the same conference in the same meeting on the same podium so be humble because that is the greatest virtue that's the third v of a good lecture the fourth v the last and by i believe the least important one is to be dressed properly for the occasion and that's vastra dharana so these are the four v's of a good lecture well is that all picture abhi baki hai mere dost the picture becomes perfect and complete if you could also infuse some humor and incorporate some satire in your talk and that becomes some vyangyam and some vikatam they should always be a purpose served through your talk and if you could also dedicate your lecture for the reason or the person behind the same then nothing like it i dedicate my lecture today to your vice chancellor and your dean of medical sciences and therefore my vandanams to both of you and the entire university and that is the seventh v vandanam at the end of your talk you will have to answer questions by the audience few of the audience might be asking you questions the answers they know already but they want to test you you need to also answer them and make sure nobody is hurt and that's the eighth v which is vivekam to be able to answer questions tactfully without hurting anybody and when that happens success happens you have delivered a successful lecture to the audience in front of you and that is never an accident it's hard work perseverance learning studying sacrifice most of all love of what you are doing success isn't about how much money you make it's about the difference you make in people's lives if my lecture today can bring about a small difference in your outlook tomorrow then i have delivered a successful lecture the only way to do great work is to love what you do when you love delivering lectures you would culminate in delivering not a good but a great lecture and then you end up winning the hearts of the audience and that's the ninth v vijayam so navaratri and therefore nine v's of an ideal and a good lecture now this person here is william francis sutton he was wanted by the fbi for bank robberies unlawful flights to avoid confinement for armed robberies there's a book by name i willy sutton the author is quintin reynolds it's the personal story of the most daring bank robber and jailbreaker of all times when finally he was caught the judge asked him why do you rob banks and pat came the answer because that's where the money is 
and therefore he decided to rob banks he actually never said that he robbed banks because he enjoyed it he loved it he was more alive when he was inside a bank robbing it than at any other time in his life this is a passion on the opposite di dimension but still he was passionate about his job of robbing banks so my first book for all of you is a book by name i willie sutton the author is quintin reynolds so i end my section 1 by telling you what are the nine qualities of an ideal and a good lecture vidya vaku vinayam vastra dharana sam vyangyam sam vikatam vandanam vivekam and finally end up with vijayam and therefore happy vijayadashmi also to all of you section 2 of my talk is about cancer we are here to discuss about cancer which is a global epidemic like the covid-19 pandemic a disease which knows no boundaries be it america uk australia our india or any country in the world cancer is present everywhere a disease which knows no boundaries but first things first this person is dr rohan from gmc dhule who was brutally beaten because he advised the kin of an accident victim to take the patient to another center because his hospital didn't have the facilities to take care of that accident victim now this was in march 2017 in that week itself there were many episodes of violence in maharashtra the indian data tells us 75% of doctors face violence at work now that could be verbal violence also but it leaves the doctor emotionally distraught for the entire week and sometimes months together latest research has shown a startling fact indians are immortal till a doctor kills them dr archana sharma that was 2017 dr archana sharma in 2022 recently committed suicide if death after operation is murder then every operation becomes an attempt to murder no doctor willfully wants to injure any patient so i protest the attacks on doctors but then how do we stop violence against doctors we possibly have few solutions number one is to form a federation of medical associations so that we as united to fight this uh, epidemic number 2 change your profession doctors apply for post of constables it's better to beat public than getting beaten by them uh it's not just me alone all of you doing equal hard work everybody is working 16 to 18 hours a day now there is this man by name mark rothko who has this painting called as yellow and blue it was sold for 46.5 million us dollars the painting is titled yellow and blue and this is how the painting looks like the upper half is yellow the lower half is blue and it gets sold for 46.5 million us dollars I am telling you we all are in the wrong profession. You should possibly have a profession like this and then auction it. This thirdly you can be the bad doctor in the last 2 months I have been able to persuade seven young people to stop preparing for a career as a doctor. After all as a doctor it's my job to save lives. some medical professionals don't want their children to enter their own profession and that's because they possibly believe in one beautiful line written by a doctor there is no happiness in medicine and there is no medicine like happiness i think it's most important to be an ideal and good doctor so navaratris nine ratris then nine essentials of a good lecture or a great lecture we will now talk about the nine qualities of an ideal and good doctor nobody wants to wait these days therefore you should see all your patients immediately number 2 give the right diagnosis on clinical grounds diagnose blood cancer by looking at the pulse the patient walks in diagnose liver cancer 
So give the diagnosis based on clinical grounds. No scans, no labs, no CT scans, no MRIs. In the Americas, if a 50-year-old male is told to get a colonoscopy as part of screening, if the report comes normal, he says, thank God. Here, if the report comes normal, the test was done unnecessarily. So, I'll just tell you how people want to get their scannings done these days. And for this, I'll take you to 1980, Dr. Jitendra and Dr. Rajesh. Do you know them? Have you heard of them? This is the way people want us to do ultrasound and come to the diagnosis. So the treatment should give quick relief, not in, hour, not in days or weeks. By the, in hours, by the end of the day, the patient should be cured of his problem. You should attend to all phone calls, reply to WhatsApp and respond to emails. You should answer all the doubts. Innumerable times should satisfy all the attendants. In Hyderabad, every third patient has somebody in America or UK. You need to talk to them also. Satisfy them as well. And sometimes they have some doctor there who tells you how to treat the patient right now in front of you and you need to do that. So America treats the patient, the medium is me. So satisfy all the attendants and all this with a smiling face and a never say die attitude. Now I told you about nine qualities. Now these are only eight qualities. The ninth and above all should not charge. Now, if you have these nine qualities, I can guarantee violence against hospitals, doctors and medical staffs can never happen. So that was section two about the nine qualities of an ideal and a good doctor. Section three, we men, or rather mankind, is physically the most ill-equipped in this world. We cannot fly like a bird. He can be killed by a tiny insect, severe malaria, trypanosomiasis, etc. You can't outrun a jaguar, leopard, cheetah or panther. You can't swim and still be powerful like a crocodile or alligator. You can't climb trees like a monkey, chimpanzee or a baboon. He doesn't have the eyes of an eagle or a kite or a hawk or a falcon. Nor does he have the teeth and claws of a wild cat. So physically man is helpless and defenseless. But there is one thing man can do better than all creatures and that is taking selfies. Look at this person and this man and this man too. Now if you thought that the fair gender was left behind, women or girls, they do much better work than, than the male counterparts. Women can take better selfies than men and they look better too. The, the point is even the cell phone makers have realized that and therefore they talk about their uh, 6MP selfie camera. Oppo will tell you I am a selfie expert. Vivo will tell you about it moonline camera and a perfect selfie. Gioni will talk about selfie flash. It's all about upload, download, play, send, update, mark, tag, etc. The basic purpose of a mobile phone is communication in times of emergency and that is being conveniently forgotten. Even the ads talk about their cameras and their qualities, but not about how the quality of communication can be improved. We are doctors first, MBBS first. I need to know my patient holistically first, then a specialist, then a super specialist. But now, nowadays, a cardiologist will talk only when a 2D echo has been done. I will talk only when a CT or a PET CT scan has been done. And any other problem has to be referred to the... So the body is now into multiple parts divided. We are super specialists later, but... At the roots, we are 
overall general doctors. So therefore, I am not concerned about the increase in AI. We all talk about AI these days. Intelligence, artificial. My concern is about the decrease in real intelligence. AI can uh, supplement, complement us, but you should not forget real intelligence. Can someone complete the word given below dash dash I dash dash I dash G? I'll give you a hint. You are doing that thing right now. Thinking, yes. That is the most important distinguishing feature of mankind. Thinking. Man can create his own atmosphere and can outwit any creature of nature. Even though physically we are helpless and defenseless. Sadly, very few people use this gift to the full potential. Going through life without thinking is like shooting without aiming. Eyes are useless when the mind is blind. My teacher, Dr. Pankajam Shah, uh, he used to tell us that you need to read volumes of books. And the same applies to all professions. So it's important to read the chapter, understand the concept, and whenever you need help after one year or two years, you need to know, go back and see where it was written. So you don't have to remember everything here. And that's not possible also, but the concept should be clear. And when required, you refer back again and make sure the patient or the problem in front of, in front of you is tackled optimally. So in the today's age of various telephones and cell phones, in the current scenario of computers and laptops, MacBooks, iPods, iPads, in the present era of various social media, including Dr. Google and WhatsApp University, the habit of reading books is rapidly dwindling and withering away. Especially the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us how our next generation is completely hooked to gadgets and not the way we grew up reading books, reading paper books. Even we are now to a large extent hooked to tablets or iPods or phones. So my sole purpose is therefore to try to see if I can help regenerate to some extent the dying art of reading books. And therefore I told you my book number one is I Willie Sutton by Quentin Reynolds. Do buy the book and read that. One best book is equal to 100 good friends. But having said that, the reason why all of you have come here is because you also get time to interact with your friends. Otherwise, you are busy with your day-to-day -day, uh, journey of learning and researching. But one good friend is equal to a library. So cancer, how do you treat cancer? You snare it or you burn it or you poison it. Snare it, which means surgery. Burn it, radiation oncology, x-rays. And chemotherapy means giving poisons. So surgery is like, uh, like you try to remove what all can be seen with a good margins around. Radiation oncology is x-rays to burn the diseased area. Chemotherapy is given usually intravenously, sometimes oral pills also, so that it can eliminate the dead cells. But it works as a toxin or a poison and therefore chemotherapy means therapy with chemicals. And these chemicals don't distinguish the abnormally dividing cancer cells from the normal cells and therefore we have side effects. Now the malaria, uh, the, the mosquito bites us. The malarial parasite enters our blood. We give anti-malarials. The malarial parasite dies. We have no side effects. That's because that parasite is different from our body cells. Typhoid happens because of bad food or bad water. A bacteria causes typhoid. You have a lot of bacteria now. You use an antibiotic. The typhoid eliminated. But you have no adverse events. That's because the bacterial cell is different from my cell. And therefore, antibiotics kill the bacteria but cause no harm to me. Cancer, one rogue cell in our body, which is very much like us, is dividing perennially. 
and therefore if you want to kill a cell which looks very much like us you are bound to end up in side effects and that's why chemotherapy has side effects like hair loss lot of ulcers in the mouth white blood cells falling down red cells going down platelets going down i am sure there might be one or two people who possibly fought cancer in this very audience or there might be family members or friends here of you all who might have suffered this disease fighting cancer is like climbing these treacherous mountains some people want to climb and conquer mount everest inclement weather low oxygen less food water scars and on top of the trying to climb against gravity to reach the mountain top and that's one reason why i thought i should give my book number 2 to all of you today a book by name into thin air the author is john krakauer it ranks among the great adventure books of all times it's the personal uh, account of the mount everest disaster a team of people went on to conquer the mount everest a third of them died on the way a third of them could not conquer got injured some of them permanently and only a third of them were able to reach the mountain top and put their country's flag atop mount everest unlike cardiology unlike nephrology or unlike neurology as sir rightly mentioned in cancer too not every patient is able to conquer the disease but it's important that these people fight the disease so therefore i call my cancer patients or their families as not cancer warriors the disease did not worry them they fought the disease and therefore they should be labeled as cancer warriors so every patient and every family who is afflicted with this disease are fighting a battle on various fronts that could be financial emotional physical in on top of that it's sometimes very draining mentally and therefore we should label them as cancer warriors the very first medical cure of a liquid cancer a leukemia happened in 1946 that was childhood blood cancer the very first medical cure of a solid cancer happened in 1956 that disease is called as choriocarcinoma it's basically a disease of a failed pregnancy the drug which caused the cure of both those types of cancers was called amitopterin then which we all now know as methotrexate our very own yalla pragada subba rao was able to identify and produce various folate antagonists and the principal drug is methotrexate globocan data in 2012 10 years back 32.6 million 5 year cancer survivors what does 5 year mean if after the anti treatment gets over the patient comes for check up every 3 months every 4 months for 5 years if the disease doesn't come back for 5 years it's unlikely to come back in more than 90% therefore you label them as cured if not in remission globocan data 2022 more than 50 million 5 year cancer survivors so it's not like the living 5 years they are free of cancer for Five years, and therefore they're labeled as cured, and you can forget that is a nightmare. So this is the strongest testament to the progress in this fight, or in this crusade against cancer, or to cancel cancer. Progress depends on collaboration. To go fast, you can go alone. But chemotherapy alone cannot cure all the cancers. I therefore require the help of my surgical oncologist. to operate upon a breast cancer i require the help of my radiation oncologist to give x rays to treat and therefore it's a collective effort of a team of doctors surgery is like army you just eliminate the whole tumor radiation therapy is like air force x rays from outside going through the air and finally chemotherapy is like navy given into the blood and therefore the army the air force and the navy have to conglomerate to win this crusade to cancel cancer so to go far 
go together. If this university has to go far, all of you have to go together. Right from the VC to the dean to the staff to the researchers and the students. So the first way in a medical oncology to combat cancer is therapy with chemicals or chemotherapy. But as we all know, chemotherapy can have side effects, understandably so. This man is Siddhartha Mukherjee, an Indian born American physician oncologist who wrote this book by name The Emperor of All Maladies, my third book for all of you. And this book won the Pulitzer Prize, the Time magazine, one of the hundred most influential books of the last hundred years. The New York Times, among the hundred best works of non-fiction. The movie RRR is a movie of fiction. Now this book ranks among the hundred best works of non-fiction based on facts over centuries of how we went on to fight the disease cancer. So regarding the disease cancer, regarding neoplasia, regarding tumors, discoveries, developments, inventions, innovations, researches, advances, breakthroughs, sometimes shortcomings and pitfalls. Now regarding the cancer patient, their families, their treating doctors, their paramedical staff, their highs and lows in their lives, ups and downs, some people who shot to fame, some who went into oblivion, the famous the not so famous and the unheard. All of them have been discussed elegantly in a language which even a layman can understand. So this book is a book which should be read by all of you. You don't have to be a doctor to read this book. Any layman who, anybody in, from class 10 onwards can read the book. Cancer is defined as the defining plague of our generation. This book is a bio biography of cancer, an attempt to enter the mind of this immortal illness, to understand its personality, to demystify its behavior. Siddhartha Mukherjee, the emperor of all maladies. Section 4 of my talk is about this lady by name Rebecca Sklut. And Rebecca Sklut from her teenage to your left to her middle age to your right, light, researched extensively on this woman by name Henrietta Lacks. Now this was the place where Henrietta Lacks spent her childhood. And you can see her parents are reading a book. Can you make out? The book name is Medical Genetics. The parents didn't know at that time, one day, the daughter standing behind them, Henrietta Lacks would be called as the mother of modern day genetics. The black history that's not taught in school. The immortal black woman, Henrietta Lacks. I've used the word immortal. And this is her death certificate. She died on 4th of October, 1951. And this is the place where she lies buried. Born on 1st of August 1920, died on 4th of October 1951, which means at a tender age of 31 years, we lost her. No dead woman has done more for the living. All this captured beautifully in a book by name, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, the author is Rebecca Sklut. So that's my fourth book for all of you. So you must have realized that I am not trying to take you into the details of cancer treatment, but letting you know which all books you should read, which can be easily read and understood to understand the nuances of how you try to eliminate this disease. So she died in 1951. What happened next? changed the world, a fascinating, harrowing, necessary book. She died in 1951. The tumor or the cancer that killed her has been alive and is growing to this day right now. Scientists have grown some 20 tons of her cells. That was when this black and white PPT was prepared. 
Now we have more than 55 tons of our cells. So we learn more about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. HeLa, HeLa cell line are the cell lines which is where you work in biology. So some of you who have read about the HeLa cell and understand that the HeLa stands for Henrietta Lacks. Her name was Henrietta Lacks, but scientists knew her as Gila. She was a poor black tobacco farmer whose cells, taken without her knowledge in 1951, became one of the most important tools in medicine, vital for developing the polio vaccine, for cloning, for gene mapping, for in vitro fertilization, and of course, cancer research and cancer treatment. The reason why these cells are so precious because they allowed us to perform experiments which would have been impossible with a living human being. Before that time, you were working on guinea pigs or rodents or canines and extrapolating that to human beings. But now you could work on human cells so that you end up causing minimal harm to people who benefit from the invention. By 2000 and of course as a research student here in this university, you all know the importance of scientific publications. It's publish or perish. By 2009, 60,000 scientific publications about research done on these cells. In the last decade now, that number has swelled to more than 1.2 lakh scientific articles published solely based on work done on the HeLa cells. And it's involved in more than 11,000 drug patents. So more than 55 tons of our cells, more than 1.2 lakh scientific publications and more than 11,000 drug patents. Can you beat that? That's what Henrietta Lacks is. These cells have been bought and sold by the billions and yet she remains virtually unknown and they, her family members, cannot even afford health insurance. Very sad and very bad. But this, these cells continue to contribute to molecular science and is used in laboratories. Can anyone guess the latest impact what the HeLa cell lines have done to mankind or to all of us? The COVID-19 vaccines all of us took is because of the HeLa cell lines. We talk about the COVID-19 vaccines, but they were able to produ produce in such enormous amounts only because of the HeLa cell line available to us. Section 6 of my talk is the man who has no sense of history is like a man who has no ears or eyes. If you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know it's part of a tree. Now this is Paul Ehrlich, a microbe hunter. He was called as the father of chemotherapy. He was interested in various stains, but he was also a microbe hunter. And at that time, syphilis, a disease, was rampant and causing trouble to human or mankind. He wanted to find out a drug which could kill the syphilis bacteria, but still cause no harm to the host who is harboring the infection. And therefore, he gave the concept of a magic bullet, selectively toxic only to the bacteria, but cause no harm to the human being who is having infection with that bacteria. And this he labeled it as a magic bullet. And that was in 1910 labeled as arsphenamine. He worked on arsenicals and we found out that salvarsan, an arsenic compound, was able to achieve exactly that. Kill the syphilis bacteria, but cause no harm to the human who is having the infection. Salvarsan is, he got the Nobel Prize for this. Salvarsan is also called as arsenic compound 606. Why 606? He failed 605 times to find out the right arsenic compound which could harm the syphilis bacteria at the same point of time cause no harm to the host who is harboring the infection. So that's what I talk about passion and compassion. And the third is perseverance. You need to be patient 
with your patient afflicted with cancer so that is what is called as targeted therapy targeting the abnormality found on the cancer cell and avoid the normal cells unlike chemotherapy so chemicals are like atomic bombs they also kill the innocent neighboring bystander cells but if you could find out a target which is causing the cancer to multiply abnormally and if you could have a drug for that it's called as targeted therapy that happened in to two decades back on 28th of may 2001 for a disease for a blood cancer by name chronic myeloid leukemia prior to that the treatment for cml was the treacherous bone marrow transplantation transplantation itself can kill 10 to 20% of patients another 30 40% of them have devastating side effects but now we don't talk of transplant simple oral pill which is targeting the abnormality on the chronic myeloid leukemia cells so we unfortunately don't have such targets for every cancer but we are moving in that direction and therefore in the last 20 years have seen the rise and rise of not chemotherapy but targeted therapy in cancer practice toms river is the name of a township close to new jersey and that's my fifth book for all of you toms river is the name of the book by dan fagin and it actually is the name of a place of a township near new jersey and this is dan fagin who wrote this book by name toms river this book also won the pulitzer prize like the book by siddhartha mukherjee and the foreword is given by siddhartha mukherjee himself a thrilling journey full of twists and turns toms river is essential reading for our times he handles topics of great complexity with the dexterity of a scholar the honesty of a journalist and the dramatic skill of a novelist when such a foreword is written by someone like siddhartha mukherjee you dare not put this book down do buy this book and read this book by name toms river a story of science and salvation a story of a town plagued by pollution from its surrounding industries from 1950 to all the way beyond 1980 the chemicals from the seba gaigi company around the toms river township was polluting the land the soil the air and the water and therefore people who were uh, working in cancer centers were finding more and more of cancer patients coming from this particular place only when researchers went to find out why the incidence of cancer is so high they realized that this was a cancer cluster because of the industries polluting the land the soil the air and the water the culprit was found salvation happened when they permanently shut down these chemicals and these industries these industries produce the aniline dyes which are used to color our clothes so salvation happened when they stopped the chemical industries now if you could remove the bug or the parasite causing the cancer that's also one way of tackling cancer there is a specific type of stomach cancer called as maltoma the lymphocytes in the mucosa of the stomach they become cancerous that's because of a bacteria helicobacter pylori which causes this gastric maltoma or stomach cancer non hodgkins lymphoma for stage 1 and stage 2 this cancer you don't give chemotherapy or radiation or surgery you just give antibiotic therapy targeting the bacteria and the stage 1 stage 2 cancer just melts down so that's the uh, emergence of antibiotic remove the bug or the parasite causing the cancer every cancer the cause is not known for cervical cancer cancer of the uterine cervix uh, the the opening of the uterus we have a virus called as human papilloma virus this virus is the main culprit for causing cancers of the cervix in females the cause is known 
you now have cervical cancer vaccines which have more than 99% efficacy in preventing cervical cancer because they are preventing infection by the human papilloma virus. So therefore vaccines make inroads. If the cause is known, you can tackle the cancer. So can, you, can anyone guess how many sections I have planned for all of you? Nine sections. So coming to the last few minutes of my talk. Section 7. You, Some of you must be dog lovers. If you could train dogs appropriately and adequately, they can diagnose cancer by sniffing at human secretions and human excretions. Much the way like Dr. Jitu and Dr. Raju did in 1980. Arlene Weintraub is an ardent dog lover who wrote this book by name Heal, where she talks about the vital role dogs play in the search for cancer causation and maybe cancer cure. So that's my uh, sixth book for you, Heal by Arlene Weintraub. This book stems from a truth many a dog owner knows. Man's best friend, of course dogs, is deeply susceptible to cancer. And they get the same cancers as we humans do. The same pathogenesis. The difference is, if the incidence of cancer is 500 per 1 lakh population in humans, it's more than 5,300 per 1 lakh dogs. So more than 10 times higher incidence of cancer in dogs. 1 in 4 dogs or 2 in 5 dogs develops cancer. The same treatment which we use to treat human cancers works equally effectively against canine or dog cancers. So same pathogenesis, same medicine and therefore experiments on dogs can be extrapolated to humans. The other extreme, the opposites are elephants. Elephants do not get cancer. Or elephants rarely get cancer and therefore they may hold the cure for cancer. Elephants don't get cancer and scientists think they know why. We'll try to compare humans to elephants. Age approximately 70 years, almost the same. But weight 62 kilos versus 5000 kilograms. Number of cells in trillions versus quadrillions. Cancer mortality in humans in the best of centers is around 20 to 25 percent with the best of treatment, the best of uh, technology available to us. First of all, elephants don't get cancer. They rarely get cancer. They get cancer. You don't treat them. It becomes stage four. Even then, less than 5 percent of elephants will die because of a stage four advanced incurable cancer. And that's because of one important difference. There is a gene on chromosome number 17 which produces a protein called as P53. P standing for protein, it's weighing 53 kilodaltons. We humans have two copies of these genes. Elephants have 40 copies of this gene. And that's the difference of why elephants do not get cancer and we are prone to cancer or we get cancer. They rarely get cancer because there are 40 copies of a gene which codes for a cancer suppressor protein. A cancer fighting protein by name P53. We humans have only two copies. It's not just the quality, quantity, even the quality also. The elephant P53 does not work the way the human P53 does. In both the chromosomes, you are producing P53 both in elephants and humans. But what does the human P53 do? Somewhere a DNA is going wrong and tending to become cancerous. The human P53 tells the genome, stop dividing, I, I will repair the damage and the DNA gets repaired. The elephant P53, the moment it knows some fault has happened, the slightest of a discrepancy, it just kills the cell then and there. So killing cells is a better bet than trying to set them straight or repairing. So we try to repair, it eliminates and eradicates, it nips the problem even before the bud forms. It's like buying a new car for even a small dent rather than fixing an old one. 
and therefore my seventh book for you is a book by name P53. The name of the book is P53, the gene that cracked the cancer code. The author is Sue Armstrong. It's a fascinating story of human ingenuity. Lee and Frommany were two researchers who worked in various families where they found generations were getting cancers. The great grandfather had possibly uh, bone cancer, the grandmother had breast cancer, then somebody has colon cancer and now so every, everywhere some family member had some cancer and then they coined the syndrome. My eighth book for, I told you nine books. The second last book is a book by name Lee Frommany Syndrome because they researched extensively on families where cancer was being found. And what they found was these family members had only one copy of P53. And therefore we normally have two copies. If it's only one copy, the risk of getting cancer is 25 fold increased. And therefore P53 is the first cancer suppressor gene. The job in elephants is to eliminate abnormal cells. In humans is to uh, repair the damaged DNA. It's the genome guardian found on chromosome number 17. On one hand prevents cancer development, on the other hand tries to repair damaged DNA. And that's why we are trying to see if we can use P53 gene as a gene therapy. Unfortunately in cancer we have not yet succeeded. But we have made some achievements with what is called as immunotherapy. Stimulating the body's immune cells to fight the cancer. And so section 8 of my talk is to let you know that we believed before 1960 that blood supply reached tumors because the pre-existing vessels dilate and therefore cancers grow. So we thought the blood supply is dilated and therefore the blood vessel can produce uh, more nutrients to the tumor. We realized after 1970 that formation of new blood vessels makes the cancer tumor grow. So formation, genesis, new, neo, blood vessels, angio. So neo, angiogenesis. So cancers grow because the cancers will tell the neighboring blood vessel to produce more and more new blood vessels. This is a small tumor measuring 2 millimeter, avascular, dormant. Its center is supply. It's getting starved of oxygen and nutrients because diffusion can happen up to the outer 2 or 3 mm only. So if a cancer is 1 centimeter, only the outer rim gets the nutrients, oxygen, I mean it's the center 7 mm doesn't get these nutrients. Therefore they die, again the cancer shrinks to become only 2 or 3 mm. If that were the case, no cancer can grow beyond 2 millimeters. What does the cancer do? It starts producing something called as vascular endothelial growth factor. So this will now work on the endothelial cells of the blood vessels and tell it to sprout out new blood vessels to the source producing the VEGF. The tumor is now larger and more vascular. Some of you uh, who know cancer patients will have heard that breast cancer surgery has been done, colon cancer operation is done and now the CT scan or the PET scan is normal. But still the doctor said 12, take 6 cycles of chemotherapy or 12 cycles of chemo. My PET scan also is normal, no? Everything removed. So what happens is, this is a leaky vasculature. These are newly formed uh, juvenile vessels. And therefore, a lot of gaps are there. The cancer cell also gets a chance to disseminate into the blood circulation. And therefore, you have systemic microscopic metastatic disease. And so, you give chemo after surgery as an add-on, as an adjuvant to eliminate this circulating systemic microscopic cells. And that's the era, that's, that's the treatment called as anti-angiogenic therapy targeting the VEGF with a drug by name bevacizumab. So the last section of my talk, section 9, is about this man by name Clifton Leaf and my ninth book for all of you is The Truth in Small Doses. And all the books I have shown to you 
are not voluminous books. They are small books. They run into a few hundreds of pages, but not uh, big volumes of books. And once you start reading the first three or four pages, you will then not put down the book till you have read the entire book. Why we are losing the war on cancer and how to win it is what Clifton Leaf talks in this book, The Truth in Small Doses. It's because we think one size fits all. Breast cancer is not breast cancer. You could have a hormone receptor positive breast cancer and therefore we use hormone therapy. You could have a HER2 positive breast cancer, human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 positive breast cancer. You could target that by using an anti-HER2 antibody. And so you can use antibodies to target surface receptors or hormone therapies. These are the nine ways in which medical oncology practice has evolved. So that finishes my nine ways of treating cancer in medical oncology. So coming back to what our VC said, cancel cancer. Success is possible not for canceling cancer, but also preventing cancer. I spoke about treatment, but what about preventing cancer? Angelina Jolie showed us how to prevent cancer. A radical way, her mother had a, had a faulty breast cancer gene which caused breast cancer in her. When she got herself checked, she also had the faulty gene. And so a very high chance of getting breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So what she did, she didn't have any cancer. She got her breasts removed. So no breast, no breast cancer. She got the ovaries out. So no ovaries, no ovarian cancer. That's a radical way of approaching. But more importantly, she came out in open to talk about her problem. And that's why all patients of breast ovary cancer now by default either ask for or get the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene testing done. BR standing for breast, CA standing for cancer, BRCA gene 1 and 2. And therefore it's called as the Jolie effect. The impact it had on testing has impacted numerous women and clinicians across the world. All of you have sat for almost 45 minutes with me, bearing me patiently, education never ends Watson. It's a series of lessons with the greatest for the last. So what can be my greatest lesson to all of you? And that would be to prevent cancer, right? So do you know that you are what you eat? And so a healthy, hygienic, balanced diet is the first step to prevent cancer. And this is my last sentence for all of you. Now that is not a balanced diet. <laughs> so number one is a healthy, hygienic, balanced diet. Number two, do you know that if you bath at least twice in a day, avoid tobacco, avoid alcohol, go to gym for fitness at least five days in a week, do yoga, pranayam, meditation, have sufficient sleep, Eat seasonal fruits after each meal. Nowadays, every season, every fruit is available. Avoid unnecessary stress, strain, undue fatigue, including that from your spouse. Stop using addictive drugs, tea, coffee, and get master health checkups every year. Then you may or may not be the Pope or the Satya Sai Baba or a state's CM or a country's president, you'll still die when your time comes. <laughs> so be happy, make merry. God has given you one life. Live to the fullest and never ever miss a chance to attend such academic meetings organized by your VC and Geeta Madam. Thank you so much. <laughs> so these are the nine books which I was discussing. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, uh, I don't understand this matter. Now that you said, I don't know if you can see this picture. But the thing is that what I had heard you talk about, and it had made me more. And uh, the thing is that we came across uh, a lack of people, like eight chapters for the world. And so if somebody doesn't have a proper insurance, or some uh, you know, 
Yeah, ma'am. The drug you took was accepted. Yeah, ma'am. So that was a drug from Roche. Yeah. As you write, it's costing more than a lakh. At that time, I think one point one lakh. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have various Indian companies which have come with the same drug, madam. I For example, yeah, from Zydus. Yeah, exactly, ma'am. Uh, no, no, ma'am. I mean, like you need to understand that it takes. Hundred drugs fail, and then only one drug comes out, madam. So I, I told you about arsenic compound six zero six. He failed the six not five times, and got success only on the six not six attempt. I am not here to support any drug company. He is now with forty five thousand per month. That's fine. Intas is now twenty thousand per cycle. So it's a long way. It takes a long time. These are biological molecules. You are using a protein as a target, and then developing an anti-protein to that. So it's not an antibiotic. It takes time and research to and come to a conclusion. I'm, I'm still talking about biological trials like my brother-in-law had multiple myeloma. Mm -hmm. So in, for that also, one doctor has been looking for clinical trials for this drug that we talked about, etc. It's not available. Uh, those trials are not available in India. What is India doing for clinical trials? Trials are happening, ma'am. But as you rightly said, trials for such costly molecules are extremely <coughs> tough. If a drug company has to do a clinical trial, it has to actually buy that drug, madam, and then the drug has to be given to the patient. So it's something like even the Intas or Zydus, they have done the trials. What they did, they had to produce their own molecule. Hundred patients, hundred patients get the original molecule to make sure that all of them have the same outcome, and that hundred patients getting the eighteen cycles original brand which had been bought by them runs into huge. But we have come a long way, madam. As I told you, from more than one lakh, now the cost is twenty thousand only per injection. <laughs> so it, it, it's developing, ma'am. Yeah, it's all make in India. We are proud of it. The cervical cancer vaccine, for instance, now the vaccine is costing around three thousand, four thousand. It's now coming up with only. You must have seen in WhatsApp messages also. It's coming only at two fifty rupees, four hundred rupees now. It's just a matter of time. Yes. Wonderful lecture. I am Dr. Satya Lakshmi, a medical doctor, and I work in the Central University Health Center for thirty years. He re retired now. My uh, question to you is about the awareness about the self-examination of breast to prevent cancer. So, uh, can these uh, young ladies be taught to about uh, the self-examination? How they should do? How frequently they have to do? Uh, what is your opinion about? Absolutely, my very nice question. There is a term called as cancer screening, which means you are screening a normal human being and trying to find out a problem before it's causing any problem to the human being. There is no lump, no discharge, nothing. So then you do some investigation, screen the cancer to identify in stage one, or even in a pre-cancerous condition. All cancers cannot be screened, as you rightly said. For breast cancer to be identified early, number one is BSE, breast self-examination, every month after the fifth day. Choose one day after the mm, menstrual period, and then every month examine. Every yeah, yeah, ma'am. Three things. Number one was BSE. Number two is. CBE clinical breast examination every year you need to visit a clinician who can do a clinical breast exam because their hands are tuned to identify some lumps or bumps which you might not be able to and lastly as ma'am rightly mentioned after the age of 40 or some sort of societies say 50 years go for regular mammograms 
once in a year or two years depending on the mammogram reports are. So in that way you can identify breast cancer early. Ma'am, I completely agree. Mammograms are an excellent way to screen and identify breast cancer early. The second cancer is cervical cancer. Pap smear can identify cervical cancer in its precancerous stage only. Excellent cure rates. The third is prostate cancer. A cancer of the male prostate, age more than 50 years, do a simple blood test called as prostate specific antigen or serum PSA levels, you can identify prostate cancer much, much early. And lastly, for all males and females who are above 50 years of age, stool examination for occult blood, sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy beyond 50 years of age, once in one or two years. Only these four cancers can be screened. A person is smoking tobacco cigarettes for daily 40 of them for the last 40 years. He is 60 years now. At 20 years, he started smoking. 60 years, he decides to stop smoking and gets a CT scan chest done. A CT scan chest is completely normal, low cancer. He stops smoking and every three months, he goes and gets a CT scan done. At 62 years, 8 CT scan, all are normal. 62 years and 3 months, it's lung cancer, stage 3 or stage 4. So some cancers you can't screen. Though we have now techniques like low-dose CT chest to screen heavy smokers. But by and large in India, it's tough to run such a large-scale CT screening program. In Japan, they are very, very prone to get gastric cancer. There they do regularly upper G endoscopy as screening and they identify gastric cancer early. These are the only few cancers where you can screen and diagnose cancer early. One of the most important tools as you rightly mentioned is breast self-examination and as ma'am rightly said is regular mammograms. I just had one question about HPV vaccine. So, uh, all zero positives don't show become HPV positive, but every cervical cancer, almost 99.99% is because of HPV. Mm -hmm. But then the intervention is prepubertal. So that's the paradox of giving HPV vaccine uh, with the presum presumption that after 30 years, if that patient is going to be zero positive, then what are the chances? So it's like a funnel, zero positivity all, versus. So do women, you still recommend? All women are great souls. All men are brutes. <laughs> the human papilloma virus <laughs> is Seven. found in the male. Seven. The females do not have the human papilloma virus. It's we males who introduce that. And therefore, the efficacy is best at the early years before the first intercourse happens. And therefore you say from nine years of age onwards and before marriage, you should get the HPV vaccine done. Unfortunately, as, as I told you, all men are brutes, ma'am. We try to give cervical cancer vaccines to females, to girls. It should be to boys first. Exactly. Yes. It's also there, but hardly any boy gets it done. Thank you. Uh, can this vaccine be introduced in the national immunization schedule of our madam, country? You are right. Uh, is it uh, given in no, public madam, schools? That's the point. It's the but you have to buy it. So what happens is at this point of time, it's not free like polio vaccine, DPT, etc. As you rightly mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, I can give you the contact numbers. You can contact them in bulk. They supply at much lesser rates. If I'm not wrong, Poonawala's vaccine will come very soon. It will be costing between 250 to 400 only. The cost will become almost like 10 times less. Any other question? If not, I mean, uh, thank you very much for this talk. And uh, the way you brought it up is, you know, so unassuming <laughs> what you're going to talk. And I know what experience you have. 
I would profusely thank you for your lecture and an official vote of thanks by Anita, my colleague. From the thank, thank you very much. And I would, before we propose a vote of thanks, I would request our Vice Chancellor to give a token of appreciation. come to that section which is Vandanam, the eighth V, am I right, Dr. Satya? Yes. Yeah, so as was pointed out by Dr. Satya himself, this session can't be concluded without thanking two Vs. And it is anybody's guess, one V is our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor B.J. Rav Garu, and another V being Professor Geeta Vemuganti. Thank you both for helping organize this session and also for gracing this occasion and coordinating it so very well. I think all the three of them deserve a round of applause. Can we? So there are a lot of highlights to take away from the talk and the speaker himself has summarized it very well by giving the list of nine books for us to take it with us for life. If we read it, it will remain with us for life. And I hope we have access to these books through our university library. Or, you know, everything is online these days and that can happen too. So, and um, going further, i like to thank the Dean School of Life Sciences for providing this hall to conduct this, uh, this session, this talk. And I thank all the university fraternity who have come here in large numbers the current faculty, the retired faculty, the scholars, the students, and each one of you for making this talk a great success. And I hope we carry forward the message of cancer awareness throughout this month and also beyond. And the last word, which is prevention is better than cure, is the most appealing thing. So rather than struggling to cure a cancer which has already come in, let us try and prevent. And prevention is the best medicine. And I'm proud to say that I belong to preventive medicine, but the practice of it is very, very difficult because in our country, a doctor is successful only when he or she prescribes a pill or injects an injection or gives something in the IV drip. So without all of that, let's go with these message and let us fight cancer together and let us all work towards prevention of the cancer. Thank you one and all for this session.